Welcome to the Build It Better podcast powered by FrameCAD. I'm your host, Robert Johnson, and today we are thrilled to have Larry Williams, who is um, the executive director for the Steel Framing Industry Association, SFIA. Uh, thanks for joining us, Larry. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah, now you are, where are you located? What part of the country are you in? East Coast. Um, East Main Coast. Office is in Virginia. Okay. Yep. So that's which is going to kind of tie into one of the things that I jump into here in a bit. But tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, what you do, and then kind of that 30,000 foot view of SFIA. All right. Well, let's see. I've been uh, in and around the steel framing business and steel industry for about 35 years. Maybe it's 40 years now. You can't lose track. Kind of stumbled into it. Um, you know, not intentionally, you know, started with uh, U.S. Steel as a client for a marketing and PR agency I had in San Francisco and was, uh, you know, working with them when one of their marketing folks came into the office and said, what do you think about steel framing? What do you know about steel framing? It's kind of like that was in 1992. And the answer was, I don't know nothing. Yeah, exactly. And and in fact, a lot of people didn't know uh, an awful lot about steel framing and you know, I think <clears throat> we've uh, you know kind of ridden the wave uh, as it as uh, has continued to build over the last few decades, and you know I um, I have some stories that people are would probably pay uh, for me to keep quiet, uh, <laughs> but it's been an adventure. It's been and it's been a great uh, great um, to see the industry mature and evolve and change and just become larger and stronger and and um it's uh, it's been a hell of a ride yeah you know you can it it's so funny to hear you say it. of course you've been doing it and and really kind of waving the, the banner much longer than i have although i've been in the business i i, I wasn't really in the promoting of of light gauge steel um before i we get into the real meat of it why why do you think that light gauge has been so it's been so slow to adopt into you know other than regular what we would see in traditional commercial framing yeah well i think i mean in general got to start with kind of the historical perspective that steel framing is an industry and even though you could say that that there have been coal formed shapes for 100 years steel framing as an industry really didn't get uh, start to get its legs under it until I'd say probably the early 90s. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, it's like you, you saw um, some like quarter beads or some, mm-hmm. some types of uh, um, um, uh, studs used on occasional structures, but you know, it wasn't really part of a, any kind of a formal, formal building plan. I mean, it's like normally if you're uh, up until up until about 20, 25 years ago, if you're going to build a house, you know, you just you'd build it with wood. Yeah. Right? You know, if you're going to build a uh, building, you'd build with concrete and structural steel. Structural steel has mm-hmm. been around for twice as long as cold form steel framing. And I think that, you know, what I've seen, you know, in the last um, 20, uh, 20 years, 25 years or so, uh, is that, you know, the more and more of the things that are needed for a material to not just have the occasional use, but you know, be part of the uh, of the ongoing uh, construction decision chain. A lot of those things are continuing to evolve. You know, like design standards, and you know, I mean, it's like you, people forget that you know the, the 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 basic specification upon which all engineering is um, it, it rests. Uh, there wasn't a specification until 1946. Mm-hmm. And there weren't any design standards until uh, 2002, 2003. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, you think about that and, and how how recent that is in you know in contrast with you know wood or concrete that have been around for literally uh, well, concrete has been been a uh, construction material for millennium, multi millennium, and and wood framing um, you know has been around several hundred years yeah uh, and i i think you know um you've really hit on on you know now you know the the, the main issues uh, i have uh i have become more and more aware 
that steel framing is much more prevalent in other parts of the world than it is here. And, and by that, I guess I would say m- more predominantly in the residential market, not just a commercial application like we typically, or, or we see the majority of the work here in the U.S. Um, is that because of such a, a strength, num- you know, one, the things that you've mentioned, and then two, the strength in the labor, uh, in the lumber lobby that, that we have here? Well, I think I, they're definitely part of it. I mean, you look at, you know, the, the resources that the lumber industry has available to it, and you're, you're talking about, you know, both in terms of what they generate internally and contribute to their uh, marketing and, and market support in the neighborhood of $17, $18 million a year. Um, yeah. And in addition to that, you have federal government funding through the agri- agri- agricultural department you know, in the tune of $25 million a year. And, you know, I mean, it's like, that's, uh, you know, that's, that's quite a bit of, uh, uh, quite a bit of resources. You can buy quite a bit of resources with that kind of money. But I think the other part of it too, that, you know, after kind of recognize is just the tradition, you know, home building, you know, a lot of it, you have some large uh, track developers that, you know, they operate as, as, as a corporation um, you know, but uh, by and large, you know, you have most of your houses are being built by uh, individuals who are so you consider them small businesses. Correct. You know, and, and they have, you know, they have behind them a m- momentum of tradition, which is, you know, this is all the way I've always done it. Well, I've always hear it all it. the time. Yeah. And I'm not going to make, you know, I don't feel comfortable, um, you know, making a, a wholesale change to another system. Mm-hmm. Um, um, because you know, I, I don't. Maybe I don't have the financial resources. I don't have the the risk tolerance. Um, but we do see some things happening out there where you have younger uh, younger builders who mm-hmm. are looking, who are, who are who are taking a fresh look, you know, at how they do things and how uh, how they source materials and what they build with and things like that. You know, not only we begin to see those early adopters, we can almost consider early adopters beginning to, you know, start to use steel framing. Um, but we also see some more uh, uh, the um, established, you know, mid-sized uh, home builders who are, are finding ways to integrate steel framing into their home design. So for example, you know, I know some, uh, some builders in um, the Southwest part of, part of the U.S. who they might build uh, with wood in the, um, the second story of the house, uh, but they'll use steel framing for the first floor in the basement. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, I've seen some know, of that, a real hybrid a real hybrid use, yeah. Yeah, and I think and I think that long term, I think that may be kind of the way that it goes for a little while where you know, I mean it's like in Florida where you know they they build with uh, with concrete uh, cinder block. Um, yeah. and then they put a steel truss on the, on the roof, you know, by and large. Yeah, it, it's um, it, it is interesting. I was just uh, I was just talking to somebody this week, and they were saying that that although uh, and this was in Hawaii, and and we'll we'll go into a little bit about some of that and and how some of those things can can certainly impact the use of, of cold form steel in the future. But that um, the major home builder in Hawaii has been building with uh, light gauge steel for a while because of termites. Mm-hmm. Um, was the main reason and yet using all wood headers and wood beams and and you know things like that um it, it's just it, it's i don't really care how people start using it just as long as they yeah. start using <laughs> start, as long as the, we get that wave going that direction right. but but as far as you know changing in the industry and change i think the real driving force would be you know, uh, our real help would be the building codes, um, mm-hmm. making decisions, municipalities, um, making code changes or requirements. Uh, and we've seen some of that in, in the Southern California area due to, you know, fires and, mm-hmm. and insurance companies are pushing, you know, they're, they're not going to insure a home again if you're going to build right. it with combustible materials. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, that brings us to the, to the current, you know, tragedy in, in Hawaii. Um, yeah. and, and we've gotten a lot of, of calls and, and I've been speaking to a number of people about starting up light gauge steel framing uh, mm-hmm. when they do the rebuilding 
um, in large part because the same thing happened in 2014. Not not the majority, but a, a percentage of these homes that that burnt this time burnt in 2014 because of a of a fire, a uh, yeah. brush fire yeah. that started. And and I think what you're going to see is you're going to see those municipalities and those insurance companies say, well, first of all, we can't, we're not going to just keep doing this over and over again. Right. You think that there is a there is a trend and that there is a, a push in in places to maybe change codes to the to be more favorable to come form steel? Yeah, well, we have, we've actually been at it in Southern California and Massachusetts and and in New Jersey. You know, looking at places where you know you have these very large mid rise buildings, you mm-hmm. know, that had switched over to wood and then had burned down during construction and have had, you know, very, very favorable response uh, from uh, from uh, local um, public officials to that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think we're on the doorstep of having an ordinance passed or actually enacted. It's actually been passed in, in Los Angeles for city of Los Angeles mm-hmm. um, that would require, you know, the use of non-combustible materials. Yeah, and it's um, like go over 15,000 square feet or 30,000 square feet. I can't remember what it is, yeah, I, what, that, yeah. what that is. But, yeah, um, I, and I do think that as as we become more climate conscious um, mm-hmm. and, and there's, there's all the discussions about climate change and how it, it, it could or could not be affecting fires, floods, uh, hurricanes, things of that nature, people are looking for a, a better product or a way to build things stronger straighter better you know yeah. uh, that'll last longer uh, i know i know uh, senior living assisted living um the code is of uh, you know in most part for light gauge steel mm-hmm. um so yeah it, it's it's a it's a fun time it's a time of change I, i'm with you i do see the the wave starting to, to crest a little bit mm-hmm. uh let's let's take a tack and and talk about the modular and prefabrication, the offsite construction piece that that may help be an impetus to push this this more into mainstream. Okay. What's your thoughts yeah, I mean, on that? I, I think there are. I mean, there. I think we're at, at um, uh, the nexus of a lot of factors that are happening in the world around us um, and in the construction industry that are. Um, are, are, are starting to drive change. And when I say starting, I, I'd probably go back about five years ago. We could really begin to see this change starting to, to develop a little bit of momentum. And you're talking about, you know, everything from, you know, labor shortage uh, to, you know, the environment, you know, in terms of fires or even the consciousness about, you know, how we're building, um, how the, uh, you know, some geo, geopolitical forces like, you know, the, I mean, Wow, what the pandemic did to the supply chain, you know, and you know some of the opportunities that it created for steel framing, and and then kind of to your point, more to your point, you know, how technology is has really evolved, partially in a, in kind of a response to to some of those things, you know, but it's affected the design, you know, how we manufacture products, how we right. build buildings, and you know, now we're starting to see. I mean, all of those things are supporting, you know, what I think is really kind of the next thing. Um, that is is uh, is coming down the line. We're starting to see that is really the, just the widespread, not the occasional, but the widespread adoption of offsite uh, uh, prefabrication of modular construction. I mean, really, truly modular construction. The um, the implementation of robotics. Uh, oh, yeah. I know. I know a couple of um, uh, of of folks who are uh, now playing with uh, kind of robotics in their uh, fabrication facility. And steel framing is perfect for that. I can't imagine a, a better material for, um, for implementation through offsite prefabrication or, or, or modular construction or the implementation with robotics because you know, of the material characteristics. You know? I mean, you don't Correct. have to worry about you know, that bunk of lumber and, and, and you're going to put it on a framing table and have a, you know, uh, and, and, and try to prefabricate it and expect it to maintain its shape all the way to the job site. I mean, you're going to have, I know that, you know, already with, even with uh, the panelization that's happening with wood construction, you know, the, um, 
the uh, amount of fixes on site are so high, are so massive yep. and time consuming that, you know, in fact, you know, if I were to build uh, with steel framing today, I would go with off-site prefabrication construction because the worst case scenario, you're going to be um, at the same price point as wood. Typically, yep. you're going you're to be less expensive. It's going to be faster. And <clears throat> then you have, you know, the assist of, you know, computer-aided design and, um, uh, you know, systems like the FrameCAD, you know, system, for example, you know, where you have the, the integration of the design and the automation and, you know, the, uh, you know, basically it's set up for, you know, the offsite construction. I mean, it's, um, you know, perfectly positioned for, I think, this brave new world that, uh, that I think that we're on the very doorstep of. Yeah. I agree. You you mentioned you mentioned pricing in this, and 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 I that's one of the the true misconceptions currently. Now, for years and years and years, and people still say this even today. You know, uh, light gauge steel is always going to be ten percent, fifteen percent higher than wood. Um, and and what I continue to push back to people is is it, it's if you're really utilizing prefabrication offsite construction really using a design-led methodology and using it you know to its fullest ability and capability um it, it should be a more of a pro forma look than a line item look yeah. um it, it, you know for a general contractor and you they're going to look at it and say well my lumber package is this my steel package is this and see it's a little bit higher it's not going to make sense but for that developer that really sophisticated developer and owner that looks at it and says oh wait a second um not only am I figuring all of this out before I ever start on, on the project, um, I'm getting the, the massive builder's risk uh, delta uh, change from going yeah. from combustible to non-combustible. Yeah. Your ongoing property insurance goes down. Um, the speed with which that it goes together, uh, you're going to be renting, selling units, apartments, whatever, months before the person down the street that's building out of, out of lumber. When they look at it that way, it tips that scale the other way. Um, and unfortunately, steel framers don't deal with developers. Steel framers deal with general contractors. And so having, having that discussion and making it make sense it is a real struggle unless you really start going to the top and and having them make that decision to go light gauge steel and then all of your subcontractors and manufacturers will follow thoughts on that oh absolutely well first of all i you know first thought uh, that you know pops into my my mind is, is on the price you know residential you know we've all, our our studies are what we've kind of always gone with in a normal market is that you know steel framing might be a dollar square foot you know, more expensive than, than wood framing. But you know what that dollar square foot is related to? Labor. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> labor. So what happens if you if you diminish the uh, the impact of labor on it? And this is like, you know, we're talking about a mark 15 years ago. Yep. Um, what happens if, if you diminish the impact of, of cost, um, of the labor cost, then you look at, you know, kind of long-term serviceability of the house, you know, in the resident. And, you know, if you're a builder, um, and we're actually looking to, to dig up some statistics on this, we've got a project going, going right now where, you know, if you're a builder, then, you know, your exposure for uh, construction defect liability is, you know, 10 years or so, you know, the, the uh, your exposure is going to be much diminished with a system yeah. like cold form steel frame than it would, because you're not going to have some of the cracks and some of the other problems that you get with a like a wood frame um, um, product, you know. Basically, what is organic? It, it changes, you know. It, it absorbs and and and, um, uh, and and expels water, you know, over time. Yep. And those changes will have an impact. And the other is just on insurance, you know. I mean, it's like okay, wait, that's exactly right. You know, I don't think that people understand stand the impact that. A non-combustible system can have both on short-term costs and long-term costs. We um, <clears throat> we have a team that you know that works with uh, with developers, you know, and, and help them plug in, you know, with some where some advantages are and how we can do that. And 
you know, um, one of my staff uh, members working with a developer in Houston who was building a 100-unit hotel, got mm -hmm. that individual a, was a $300,000 uh, savings on builder's risk insurance. Yeah. And then the, uh, the long-term uh, owners, the property insurance, uh, over a 10-year period, by the time you added it up, it was almost a million dollars in savings. Yeah. You know, I, I know. mean, it's... It, 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 and, it, and, you know, to, 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 tell, to tell a a developer, you know, hey, it's going to reduce your general conditions, you know, by this much, I mean, because you're going to do it sooner. The general contractor doesn't want to hear that. They're like, I'm not giving my general conditions back, you know. Yeah, yeah. But that's why it is, that's, we've been... In just my personal opinion we've been talking and preaching and pounding the pulpit to the wrong congregation mm -hmm. it, it needs to be that person that's making the ultimate decision maker the, the developer the people that are really going to reap these benefits over a 10 15 20 year time um but, you know they're not having to to treat for termites as my they're all these things that yeah, those that things. people just haven't fully realized yet mm -hmm. um I, I think we just keep we keep screaming it from the mountaintop, and uh, we are seeing. I liked what you said about kind of the younger generation coming. We are seeing those people that are coming in and saying, you know what? There's got to be with technology today. They grew up doing gaming, and you know, there's got to be a way to to make this you know faster and better. So we are yeah. seeing those innovators that are coming in that that people maybe typically in the industry have not been. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, that's, and that's actually, in fact, what kind of <clears throat> my observation was in Hawaii. You know, in Oahu, they've got up to seventy-two percent um, of homes there are built with steel. And you know, when they first started using steel, it was the the younger framers, the younger developers and builders, mm -hmm. and stuff like that, who have now you know who are now I'm saying more mature, probably a polite way to say it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, have um, you know some of us like got more snow on the roof. Yeah, um, or no and, snow on the roof in my case. In my case, <laughs> but um, but those those are the ones who uh, who kind of led the movement, and I think that's that's really what I'm seeing too. Uh, the younger developers, the younger builders, you know, are the ones who are the more the evangelists for steel yeah. because they see what they're not they're not bound by that tradition. So. Yeah, exactly. What what percentage of SFIA is traditional framers as opposed to those guys that are in the, the prefabrication manufacturing side of it? Well, I, I tell you, it's, um, well, first of all, let me just tell you about the Steel Framing Industry Association a little bit about it. Please, so yeah. We are, we are the industry association. We're the big tent, basically. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you make steel, uh, all the North American steel makers uh, are our members. If you make studs, um, uh, 89 percent of the st um, studs manufactured in the U.S. are made by S and SFIA member. Um, if you make the equipment uh, or systems that produce the studs or pull the material together, I mean, FrameCAD's a member, for example. Mm -hmm. um, if you build the building, um, you're we we represent you and. You know, if you're a design professional, you know, Cold Form Steel Engineers Institute is mm -hmm. a part of this, uh, the Steel Framing Industry Association. So soup to nuts, you know, we're, we're, the, we're the membership there. On the builder side, our, our focus in the last 10 to 12 years has really been on the non-residential construction. So, mm -hmm. you know, you don't see a lot of the small builders, uh, uh, you know, doing the non-residential jobs. They tend to be a little bit larger concerns, you know. Correct. And, and so I'd say probably that we have, uh, I'd say probably, I don't know, 40% of, of the projects uh, are being built by SFIA members. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um, and you're right, even the early adopters in the role forming technology um, have been those traditional commercial, the, the larger traditional commercial yeah. metal stud framing and drywall companies. Because they're taking it and, and adopting it to, you know, mid-rise, multi-level construction, mm -hmm. load-bearing buildings and things of that nature. Um, you know, we we just recently at, at FrameCAD at this year have really started a, a more aggressive approach into the residential market. Mm -hmm. And 
it's an uphill battle. I mean, it is, you know, again, you get back to the old boys network of, you know, we've done it this way. I've already figured it out. Why change? You know, all of that. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, which, but you know, what's interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you're doing that. We're looking at the residential market as well as an opportunity because of, you know, I talked about the pandemic, mentioned the pandemic uh, mm-hmm. a little bit ago and what that did to the supply chains and what that did to prices. And, um, and in fact, you know, I, I, I threw out like that a dollar square foot more expensive for steel for a residential uh, 2,100 square foot house mm-hmm. in 2021 because, uh, the, could, because of what happened to the supply chain disruptions. You know, the cost advantage, advantage for steel framing uh, went to about $5 a square foot. So, you know, it's like a $6 square foot swing. Well, that got a lot of people's attention. Yeah. And uh, especially, you know, if you're a builder, you know, and you have contracts to put something up and you need materials to do it. So if you're going to perform on time and, you know, your option, if your option was wood, then, you know, you were, um, uh, you were, you were basically uh, painted into a corner. And, you know, we look at that and we have, we have a project assistance line and I can't tell you the number of the volume of calls that we came, that came in on that line. From builders, home builders, home builders, sure. single family home builders, that were looking for some some help. And so we did some research and we talked to some builders and continue to talk to to single family uh, developers uh, on this. And the sense, even in the last round of research that we did um, last year, is that the, the the feeling is still that you know the you know the wood industry believes they have believes they have a, a monopoly and they treat us that way mm-hmm. uh, so absolutely they don't like it and um if we're able to provide them a an alternative then they're listening um Correct. so uh so i think there's a, i think there's a, a real a real opportunity in the single family market um you know we just need some people to exploit it right now everybody is very busy with the, um, you know, trying to keep up with the uh, uh, the construction demand today. But there is a, again, there's an opportunity in residential right now that, uh, that, but I think that will continue to exist for a very long time, regardless. Of I agree how, as well. Any kind of prices. Um, yeah. just people have, people have, have been awakened to, you know, the risks of being dependent on one material or that material. Yeah. So what have I not asked you that you want to get out today before we get away from here? I, I think probably one of the things is, you know, we've been we've been talking about it in, in general. But, you know, one of the things that I think is continues to be important is, is to be aware of how the industry is evolving um, and how quickly it's happening. And, yes. you know, that, um, that the people need to keep their eyes open. I mean, even. Things like, oh, you know, uh, um, uh, the uh, code approvals, for example. You know, the uh, the code bodies, you know, have uh, issued, or not the code bodies, they have the, um, like the ICC, you know, has mm-hmm. issued, uh, you know, their reports for generations, if you will, um, based on engineering evaluations. They're going to change how they're, de- uh, how they're doing that um, um, because they also see, you know, opportunities or the need to ensure that there's better quality control on the products that are being put in the marketplace. Um, yeah, I agree. We have a certification program that has quality control on the front end, but also quality assurance. Um, right. You know, and that is, uh, you know, we're finding that is uh, extremely valuable to a lot of uh, suppliers and builders who don't want, you know, to end up having to pull material out, off of a job because right. they've had an inspector that's come through with a mic and found out that you know that the material is too thin, or you know that the uh, the coating is not right on the material, and so they've got a um, some material in the field that hasn't been dried in yet, and then now it's brown instead of silver. Right. So yeah. um, so that's beginning to evolve. But I mean, I think that you know, I think I'm really I'm really looking forward to like the next ten or fifteen years and. You know what's gonna what what is coming out of this change? You're gonna have better products. You're gonna have better buildings. 
You know, I think that, you know, even when you talk about like robotics and automated systems, you're talking about a new set of skills that the construction industry is going to need. It's oh, not exactly. going to be people, not going to be people who's just for swinging hammers, but you're talking about programmers and, you know, people who understand pneumatics uh, mm -hmm. as, as well as they understand, you know, how to, you know, fasten material together. Yeah. Um, and I, I just, I think that that, I think, you know, I'm really hopeful. I'm, I'm I'm really optimistic about what the industry is going to look like in fifteen to twenty. Yeah, years. yeah. There's so much hope and 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 so many exciting things coming. Um, Larry, you've been fantastic. Uh, I I knew I knew once I got you going, I just pulled that cord. We'd be able to talk for forever. Um, thank you so much for being on. How can people get a hold of you if people need to want to reach out and for more information? Well, uh, visit our website. You know, it is cfsteel.org. Uh, or, or initials for coldformsteel.org. Um, in, uh, I think in a few weeks, they'll also be able to just visit us at steelframing.org. Okay. So, You're on LinkedIn, um, yeah. pretty much all the social media pieces. So, excellent. Um, listen, we're going to have you on again. Uh, we, we'll do this and, and continue as things change. We'll continue to, to bring you into the discussion. Um, so we've all built it, you know, the old way. Now let's go out there and build it better. Thanks. Yeah.